last one. Last one. I promise. This goddamn champion lives rent-free in my head. This is the last one. I promise. We have already talked extensively about Seraphine and some of the baffling decisions and extremely unfortunate implications that follow her character around, especially in the lore and in the way that she has been marketed as part of the marketing push for KDA. You can watch my previous two videos on the subject if you're interested, but TLDR, I find the way that they're using her as a digital influencer without actually having to adhere to any of the rules and ethics around influencer marketing to be super uncomfortable in the way that they're marketing her ultimate skin and the new KDA EP. And in the base game, her lore involves her using the crystallized soul of one of Skarner's people, the Brackern, as a means to power her own, literally power her own platform so she can float around and be a pop star in Piltover and Sawn, apparently with no scruples or qualms about using, you know, the actual soul of another living, sentient, sapient creature as fuel for your personal music career. A lot of people have responded to that, by the way, by saying, but the way they wrote it, it doesn't seem like the Brackern Crystal Mind's being used that way. To which I say, yeah, that's kind of, that's the problem, is that they wrote a story for Skarner, where the process of having those crystals torn from their bodies is so traumatic, painful, and awful that it renders his entire race either dead or comatose. But then, by the time we get to Seraphine, it's like, oh yeah, I mean, if I was a crystal who had been forcibly torn from my hive mind and then used as fuel in machines built to service the very same people who destroyed my entire people, I would probably be totally cool with that, and I would think it's nice that this pretty young lady wants to use my soul to power her magic stage so she can fly around and sing nice pop songs about how everybody should get along. The fact that they wrote the Brackern to apparently be okay with this is the problem. Like, that's, you didn't think through the implications of what you were doing there. So pointing at the text of the lore and saying, well, but the text of the lore says that the lore is totally okay, is kind of missing the point. I'm criticizing the fact that the lore hasn't thought through the implications of the story that it contains, i.e. that it's totally okay to use sentient souls as fuel for your machines because those souls are happy to be used as fuel for the machines. They like it. In fact, they would be offended if you even suggested not using them as fuel for the machines. I mean, just because the machines are being used specifically by the culture that murdered their people, that doesn't mean that they would be unhappy to help or anything. I mean, we wouldn't want to inconvenience them. Like, imagine if Seraphine just had to sing with, you know, the magical powers that she already has, that would be very hard for her. So, sure, let's just use the Crystal Scorpion Soul to power her magic floating stage because her creative ambitions are more important than, you know, not using souls for fuel. Anyway, we have criticized that plenty, I think. So today, rather than just go, oh, wow, this seems kind of fucked up, let's talk about some ways to unfuck it. And I want to try and be constructive about this, which means we're not just going to say, oh, delete her from the game or do something completely different. The ship has kind of sailed on that one. So rather than just say delete all this because it's garbage, let's think of some ways to make this work and produce a good story without, you know, having to overhaul the whole thing from scratch. So this option is already really popular among the community, basically. At least if I'm going by my YouTube comments and the people who are adding me on Twitter right now. Just make Seraphine the villain. The conspiracy theory that's already going around is that Riot are setting up to pull this particular trick on us. They're going to reveal that, oh no, all of this early promotion of Seraphine where she's all nice and wholesome and good? Yeah, that was all just a smokescreen. She's really an evil person, a sociopath who uses others for her own purposes. And given just how baffling a lot of her lore has been so far, that's certainly a compelling idea. It would be fun to have a villain who outwardly presents this, like, cute, bubbly exterior, but then on the inside, they are the coldest bad guy on the face of Runeterra. That would be a fascinating heel turn, and a good way to reconcile, you know, some of the unfortunate implications of her lore. But unfortunately, I don't think that's happening. Seraphine was pitched from the start, and in all of the media that Riot have been publishing around her, and in all of the talk that I've been seeing from the people who have worked on her, she was very much intended to be a nice, wholesome character. So if you wanted to make her a villain, you would have to retcon, like, 
a lot of stuff out of existence in a really awkward way. And that's where we kind of get back to the whole, oh, just delete the champion and do something completely different. I don't think that's gonna work. But there is a way that you could turn her into a villainous character and in fact, give her a really interesting and relevant character arc and make her a villain without necessarily having to change a lot about who she is. So let me set the stage for you. Everything plays out in her lore pretty much the same way that it already has, which is to say that she's born with magically supercharged hearing, which makes her exceptionally sensitive to outside noises. Her parents buy a rare Hextech crystal to craft a device that helps her deal with all those overwhelming noises. And Seraphine realizes that inside this crystal, there is some sort of consciousness or voice that then helps to guide her and teaches her how to manage her powers. Eventually she starts singing and performing and she starts attracting a lot of attention because she's a very talented performer. And the higher-ups of Piltover realize that, oh, this girl has figured out the secrets of the crystal. Well, we can't have that now, can we? And so they send Seraphine a doctor or a consultant or perhaps a therapist who tells that, oh, the voice you're hearing inside the crystal? Well, my dear, it's a common side effect of someone with your condition that maybe they would hear voices that aren't really there. It's just how your mind copes with being so sensitive to sound. It imagines sounds where none really exist. It's like having an imaginary friend, but someday you're gonna have to grow up and stop listening to your imaginary friends. But of course, phase two, some rich Piltover aristocrat discovers Seraphine and offers to essentially be her agent and they say, well, we can use that Hextech crystal to craft you a nice platform without also telling her that crafting the crystal into the platform will silence it to her so she can't hear it scream. And then they make Seraphine a star and they give her a taste of the good life, being adored, being loved, having the crowd in front of you, everyone listening to you, promoting unity between these disparate cities of Piltover and Son. Isn't it wonderful? my dear. And Seraphine falls head over heels in love with it because she's a natural performer. She loves performing and all she has to do to keep performing is ignore those voices that she hears whenever she's near Hextech crystals. That voice that she sometimes feels like she can hear coming out of the platform that she's dancing on. She just has to push those away. They're imaginary friends. They're not real. Don't think about them. Go to the next party. Give the next performance. This would allow Seraphine to retain her personality as someone who's like young, idealistic, naive, obsessed with performance, like really convinced that art can really change the world, you guys. It makes her someone whose character arc is that she needs to learn to really listen, which of course is the whole point of her superpowers is like this ability to listen very empathetically to other people and see the best in them and connect with them. Well, now she has to learn who to listen to, not to listen to the Piltover scientists and doctors and therapists who insist that there can't possibly be a voice inside the crystal, but rather to listen to her own heart that tells her that, yeah, there is something in there and it's in pain. And there would be natural high stakes in it for her too, because she has this existence as a beloved pop star. She's doing music for the people. She's maybe even changing the world, bringing Piltover and so on closer together, but in order to do the right thing, in order to free the crystal, she would have to give all of that up. That's some stakes, like that's some shit that a person can struggle with. Hell, there would even be a wonderful opportunity for a climactic confrontation with Skarner himself, this raging monster charging into Piltover, stealing crystals left and right, screaming and violent and profoundly unwilling to communicate because, you know, he's charging into the stronghold of the people who stole his people's souls. And in any confrontation with him, Seraphine would face the choice of listening to someone who looks monstrous to her versus listening to those nice people who have always been so good to her and her family. There are some good stories that could be told that way, where you could have Seraphine be the villain, essentially, of Skarner's story without necessarily turning her into like a evil blood sociopath or anything. If you don't want to change anything about Seraphine, the obvious way to make her character work a little bit better is to retcon a lot of the context around her. And that means giving Skarner an update instead, which, you know, would be kind of convenient because he really desperately needs one at this point. He's been very neglected. And one shape that that could take is to change the context around how the Brackern crystals came to power Hextech technology. 
In Skarner's lore, there's already an aspect where each Brackern searches for their soul crystal for quite a long time before they can meld with them. Now, the lore as it currently stands says that Piltover people came and mined the crystals out of the bodies of still living Brackern in a really horrifying act of violence. But what if that's not how it happened? What if instead of these crystals being something that's tied so intimately to the Brackern that like, these are Brackern crystals, they've always been part of the Brackern culture, the Brackern themselves bury them, they belong to the Brackern. These crystals are like a natural occurrence in nature, a natural mineral that just like exists. And each Brackern has one specific crystal that corresponds to their soul. So Skarner's story, the reason why he's out wandering about can be that he's not trying to reclaim the lost souls of his dead people, which boy howdy that's dark, but rather he's just a Brackern searching for his soul crystal, that one special crystal that will finally make him complete. And so the crystal that Seraphine's parents buy is not like the stolen soul of a living creature, but a crystal that just so happens to be attuned to the Brackern hive mind. Like, it doesn't actually contain any Brackern, it's just one of those crystals that a Brackern might use in order to become complete. The crystal doesn't contain Brackern souls, but it resonates with Brackern souls, giving her some connection to the Brackern hive mind, and the Brackern hive mind teaches her how to manage manage her powers. Thus, Seraphine's lore could remain unchanged, and you wouldn't have to reckon with the whole problem of, oh, oopsie doopsie, all of Piltover technology is derived from a horrifying act of violence against a sentient race of people whose souls were stolen in order to make machines out of. Now, personally, I think that in the context of Piltover and Son as being like Piltover's, oh, all the glorious parts of futurism and wonderful technology and everything so nice and shiny, ah, clean. And then Son is the dark, gritty underbelly of all of that progress in the city up above, where it's like, no, yeah, all of that progress creates a lot of pollution, actually, and it creates a lot of orphans, and it creates a really exploited underclass. So, you know, maybe you have to reckon with the socioeconomics of that kind of relentless unregulated progress, just saying. And in the context of all of that, the idea that Piltover derived their most important, powerful, and revolutionary technology from the literal murder of an entire race is like a really good metaphor for the dark side of technological advancement unfettered by the bounds of morality. You know, very Bioshock. So I would actually like to keep that aspect and just deal with it in a more tasteful and considered way than they're currently doing. But if you wanted to sidestep the whole thing, you could just retcon Skarner and his lore. Speaking of handling the whole thing more tastefully, this is what I would like to see. In this concept, her lore works out pretty much the same way that it already has, except when she realizes that there is a living soul inside of Hextech crystals. And by the way, a little bit of context, Piltover has worked out a way to create synthetic Hextech crystals that are not as powerful as the real thing, but also have the benefit of, you know, not containing souls inside them. That's an aspect that needs to be kept in mind. But anyway, once she realizes that the most powerful Hextech creations, the most glorious ones, the most important ones in Piltover's history are powered by the living souls of other creatures, she goes, ooh, that seems like a bad thing. We should do something about that. And she starts to try and bring awareness to the problem. She talks to various prominent scientists and maybe tries to get in touch with journalists, whatever. And everywhere she goes, because she's the only one who can hear the voices of the Bracker, and we got a Horton Hears a Who situation going on, she's rejected and called crazy, accused of being mentally ill, accused of being a conspiracy theorist, accused of being some kind of eco-terrorist. Because even though she's right, there's so much money and prestige and cultural cachet invested in Hextech technology that nobody can even conceive of the possibility that it could be unethical to use. Seraphine loses hope, doesn't know how to fix this massive problem that she has discovered, doesn't know how to save that living consciousness in the crystal that she possesses or the other living consciousnesses all around Piltover whom she can hear crying out for help. And that's when the crystal itself, her crystal, offers her a suggestion, because the Brackern are a people united by song. They live through song and resonance. Like, this is very much the foundation of their cultural understanding of the world. And so it encourages her, rather than to speak of the thing that she knows and she has seen, 
to sing about it instead. And so Seraphine becomes not a pop star trying to unite Piltover and Son in peace and harmony with the power of a good song, but a protest singer. And that doesn't necessarily have to mean like Bob Dylan with a folk guitar singing against the Vietnam War or Creedence Clearwater Fortunate Son, although goddamn, I would love to see Riot try and take on that kind of thing. Still the same kind of bubbly, upbeat, broadly appealing pop star that she is in the lore already, but what she's singing for is not just for people to put aside their differences, but to come together in a united purpose to, you know, abolish Hextech technology, because this is a tremendously unethical technology derived from a terrifying act of violence and something has to be done about that to return the crystals that have been stolen to the Brackern themselves to heal and begin to make amends for this historic crime. And in the process of that, you can still do the whole uniting Piltover and Sawn thing because the only way to overturn a power structure that is so desperately dependent on one resource that it refuses to give up is, well, to bring the people together, to have a popular uprising, a revolution, you might say. Although, of course, I don't mean to make any reference to like real world politics here. It's not like here in the real world we have a situation where we're depending on one particular resource that's actually super detrimental to the entire world and is causing untold pain and death and destruction and might actually lead to the end of the whole human race. And the only reason we're doing it is because a bunch of rich people don't want to give up getting rich off of it. That's not a thing that's happening. Don't worry about it. But if it was a thing that was happening, then that would make Seraphine like a really current and relevant champion with a current and relevant story tackling something that's actually relevant to the real world and isn't that a goal that's worth working towards just saying anyway that's three ways in which i think you can fix seraphine's lore right now without having to rework the entire concept or the entire champion from the ground up and to close the video out i just want to like don't be a dick to the people who worked on Seraphine, please, like, don't send them shitty messages or harassment. Like, yes, I think they fucked up with Seraphine too. I think they did some things that were a bad idea, but the writers and artists at Riot, generally speaking, have to deliver the product that leadership asks them to deliver. And sometimes that means they have to create characters or come up with story beats or create pop star focused advertising campaigns that they don't necessarily fully agree with, but they're trying to do the best they can under the circumstances. And that doesn't always work out, but you have a little bit of empathy for the creatives at Riot who are creating this thing, because this stuff is hard, it's really, really easy to get it wrong, and when you do, you have like a hundred million people and thousands of pretentious YouTube assholes like me jumping down your neck, and that's not really a pleasant situation to be in, and it's certainly not anything that they ever intended to have happen. Criticism is always okay, but try not to be like a dick to the people themselves, if at all possible, please. I fully support you being a dick to Riot's upper management, though. Those guys can go fuck themselves. Oh, and by the way, if you have ever posted in my comments, why isn't this guy hired by Riot? Yeah, that's why. Hey, thank you very much for watching. This is the last Seraphine video. I swear to God, until we do the actual What's the Deal video once she's out after I'm done with Samira, no more Seraphine. Unless something else happens, which I really hope it doesn't, but no more Seraphine. Although I do have to talk about KDA at some point. Ah! Anyway, like, comment, subscribe. I have a Patreon, I have a merchandise, so, you know, monetization, blah, blah, blah. I need money to pay rent. You know the drill. Believe me, I, I don't blame you, but I do try at the end of my videos to encourage people to, generally speaking, support content that they enjoy with whatever direct contributions that they can. Because a $1 donation, especially to a small YouTuber who's creating niche content, can be quite literally the same as thousands of views on a video. Like, it makes a huge impact to have direct support from your audience. So if there is a content creator whose work you enjoy, especially if they're smaller or niche or just starting out, consider supporting them directly with anything you can, whenever you can. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please remember to wash your hands and wear a mask and have solidarity with those people out there in the world right now fighting to make it a better place. Thank you.